Today, there are two million descendants of French Canadian immigrants living in New England. These are our stories. Welcome to the French Canadian Legacy Podcast. Venez tous jeunes filles et garçons, je vais vous raconter l'histoire de notre immigration ici au USA, de grands aventuriers de pays étrangers. This is the French Canadian Legacy Podcast. I am Jesse Martineau. Now, this week's guest is a bit of a different guest than we are used to here on the podcast, but it is a guest I am incredibly excited to talk to. Michael Troy is the host of an amazing podcast, the American Revolution Podcast. And my close friends will tell you that I always have this podcast going, whether it's in the car, walking to work, or Something like doing the dishes, basically anything. And I will frequently go back and re-listen to older episodes. It is my favorite podcast. So this is going to be really, really fun for me. And I'm incredibly excited to have this opportunity to ask about the role of Quebec in French Canadians in the revolution. Michael, welcome to the French Canadian Legacy Podcast. Hi, Jesse. Thanks for having me. This is cool. Now, before we get going about the podcast and the American Revolution, can we get your story a little bit? Can you tell us kind of where you grew up and how did you get so interested in history? Well, I grew up in the Philadelphia area, uh, so kind of surrounded by the history of our country. Always been interested in it my whole life. Just always been a fascination with me as a, as a hobby, you know, just reading, visiting battlefields, that sort of thing. And I decided to start telling my story about what I'd learned through the podcast a few years ago. That's basically it. Yeah. So, yeah. How did you decide that, you know what, I'm going to make this into a podcast? It was not... Um, Originally, it wasn't supposed to be a podcast. Really, I just wanted to do my own deep dive into the American Revolution, learn a lot more details about it myself through a lot of extensive reading. Um, I had initially planned to start writing a blog just to you know, keep track of what I'd been doing and share it with a couple other people who might be interested in this sort of thing. At the time, this is about five years ago, blogs were pretty much de dead or dying <laughs> on, on the way out at that time. So I thought that seems rather pointless. <laughs> Podcasts seem to be rather popular, so I thought, all right, if people can stand to listen to my voice for half an hour, we'll we'll give that a try and see what happens. That is awesome. Now, for people who haven't heard it, how, can you describe what is the American Revolution podcast? Well, we're really going through the period of the American Revolution in chronological order, and it's meant for people like me who kind of want to do, you know, they know the general outline of what happened maybe, but they want to have a better understanding, more general understanding of the American Revolution and how we came to be as a nation. It really starts before the revolution. I, I spent about the first year talking about the French and Indian War and the, the protest period leading up to the actual war itself. And we're going through the war now year by year. I'm, I'm up to about 1780 right now. Very cool. And how did you decide that you were going to like do this kind of narrative, really deep dive, half hour format? When I decided to do this, of course, I knew absolutely nothing about podcasting. <laughs> so I spent about a year really just experimenting with the podcast format, uh, learning what a microphone was, uh, just trying to you know make sure my voice was at, at a good level, all that sort of thing. And while I was doing that, I started writing out episodes. And it really just kind of felt like you know, about 3,000 words, which is about 20-minute read, was a a good length to tell a story. Um, you know, you can get into it a little bit, but you're not boring the uh, listener with a two-hour <laughs> lecture on, you know, some battle or something like that. So it just it just felt like a good time. So I my episode, my main episodes are about 20 minutes, and then I in the last 50 or so episodes at least added. Uh, well, I guess um, for the last couple hundred episodes, I've had a little bit of an after show, but that after show has grown over time. So now that it's pretty uh, for the last 50 or so episodes, it's been about a standard 10 minutes where I talk about various things, uh, try to, uh, I give a book recommendation, a, an online recommendation. I do a Q and a with my listeners, that sort of thing. One more question just about the podcast itself before we get going into the actual topics. Can you just talk about, because the amount of research that goes into each one of your episodes is crazy. Can you just talk about that process? How is it that you put together each one of your episodes? Because you put out something every week and it's terrific. As I said, I spent, I spent about a year before I launched my first episode learning how to do podcasts and writing episodes. So I had a bank of about 100 episodes uh, by the time I recorded and released episode one. Uh, so I've kind of been working, you know, I've, I've, we're up to about 250 episodes now. So over the last five years, I've managed to write 
150 episodes, which if you can do your math is not an episode every single week. <laughs> so sure. I, I, I've, I've actually in the last couple of months run through my bank of podcasts that I've written ahead of time. And so I've actually cut back now to rec- releasing one every other week because sure. doing the weekly has been too crazy. But yeah, I spend a lot of time reading uh, various sources. I, I try to write up an episode in advance so I have time to kind of think about it and do other things. And then, yeah, I mean, then I just record it, edit it, upload it. That's very cool. All right. Well, I, I should also mention I have a, I do have a blog for anybody who still cares about such things, which basically is a transcript of the podcast. And I include links and other sources and stuff in there for people who want to read more on the topic. Yeah. So I was going to hype that at the end, but we can definitely talk about it now. Um, that is my preferred way to listen to the podcast. Honestly, I do it with the blog in front of me because you do, you have the transcript right there. You have images a lot of times that's part of it. It's really, really cool. It's a super resource for anybody that's interested in the American Revolution. But I would definitely like to start where kind of your narrative starts. You mentioned you talked about the French and Indian War or as I heard it called when I was living in Quebec for a while, the conquest. (laughs) So very big picture question that, you know, us French people like to debate amongst ourselves all the time. Why did uh, France lose North America? (laughs) Just a small little question to get going. The short answer is it's a numbers game. Uh, The uh, at the time of the French and Indian War, the the British had about two million colonists living in North America. The French had about 75,000. And I think that made all the difference. The other big thing, of course, was uh, the British Navy, which managed to control access to the Atlantic Ocean by the end of the war and effectively cut off France from North America. It was never winnable, you didn't think, from the France side? Or would they have had to invest resources that just weren't feasible at the time? During that war, the French were caught a little without a navy that was really up to snuff, uh, that they had not invested the kind of money that they needed to in the navy. That aside, though, the French were winning the war for most of the war. Uh, They had made very good alliances with many of the Indian tribes, uh, which were very effective against keeping the uh, British uh, on their heels. As you know, the the war initially started because Virginia and the uh, French in Quebec were contesting over land, which is today Western Pennsylvania. At the outbreak of the war, and for several years thereafter, the the British were basically cut out of that entire Western area. Anything west of the Appalachian Mountains, if a British colonist ventured in there, they were very likely to be killed by hostile Native Americans who were allied with the French. So the French did do a very good job, but the British actually had a hard time getting many colonists to leave their comfortable homes on the East Coast and march inland for king sure. country to try to kill these Indians who were notoriously, uh, I know savage is a loaded word. It's a word they used at the time. And in some ways, I think it's right. I mean, they did not just kill people. They would you know, burn you alive or flay you alive or do all sorts of other really horrible things to anyone they captured. And this was a method. I mean, it was a deliberate tactic to keep people scared from venturing in there and encroaching on their lands. And it was very effective. And the British did not, the colonists did not want to go in there. And the only way the British eventually did get the colonists to really step up and and move in there was uh, bringing over heaps and heaps of gold and silver and paying the militia a lot of money to go in and fight. And, um, and, and that basically encouraged a lot of the militiamen then to go in and, and fight alongside the British regulars and, and, finish up the war successfully for Britain. Sure. Now, I want to stick a little bit with the pre-war period, um, because a topic that an an author we've had on the podcast a couple of times, David Remet, he's written about on his personal blog, um, is the Quebec Act. But we haven't really talked about it too much on the podcast itself. What was the Quebec Act and why were the colonists so angry as a result of this? As I just said, the French and Indian War was fighting over the lands that were south of Quebec and west of the British colonies, uh, the areas today that is the Ohio Valley, western Pennsylvania, uh, West Virginia, that whole area. The French and British had been fighting over that, or at least contesting claims over that for more than a century. After the French and Indian War, the British finally could declare victory. They had essentially kicked the French off the continent. Uh, The French, who continued to live in Canada, became British subjects, loyal to King George. But this was all British territory now. And so the British colonists in the lower colonies thought, wonderful, we can finally move west and 
start um, settling all this territory. Native Americans, as I've mentioned before, were not terribly happy about this idea, and they had engaged in Pontiac's Rebellion, which was in one of the first really unified uh, pan-tribal Indian uprisings that was really effective in trying to keep colonists out of this area. Although that was put down, the British basically said, we don't want to fight this fight. And King, the king issued a proclamation, actually his privy council issued it, basically saying British colonists may not move west of the Appalachian Mountains. The colonists were not happy about this because moving sure. west was the way that they could grow in wealth and power. So, they, But they basically thought this was going to be a temporary thing. It's not going to last forever. We will, at some point, be able to push west. Our, you know, our, The size of our population is just going to demand it. Then in 1774, uh, about a decade after the proclamation had been issued, Britain issued the Quebec Act, or Parliament passed the Quebec Act, which also had the unfortunate timing of being passed at the same time the Intolerable Acts were passed, or the Coercive Acts, which were a series of laws designed to come down on the British colonies uh, for protesting uh, British laws and British rules and, and sure. basically being really troublesome um, rabble that was acting violently against British officials. Right. So the British passed a bunch of acts punishing uh, specifically Massachusetts, but they generally applied to a lot of the English colonies. That same year, they passed the Quebec Act, which essentially expanded the province of Quebec to take over all that disputed land in the Ohio Valley and what is today West Virginia and all that area became part of Quebec. That just drove the British uh, colonists nuts because they're saying, we have been fighting for Britain for God knows how many decades to secure this land for us. Right. And the British just turn around and give it away to the French in Quebec, who are then free to move on in there and take up as much land as they want. And of course, many British colonial leaders had invested in land companies and speculation, expecting that at some point they would be able to move in take possession of and sell this land, and now it's all being given away to the French Quebecois, who were their longtime enemies. And yes, now they're technically French subjects, but sure. you're still giving all of our land to our traditional enemies. So they were very, very unhappy about that. Which makes sense. Now, was there any efforts, I mean, before we even get to Lexington and Concord, to bring Canada along for the ride with the other colonies in this battle for independence? Uh, before the war, uh, there was not a whole lot. Yes, they, Quebec was invited to the Continental Congress in 1774. Uh, they did not send representatives. Um, as I said, the, the colony was relatively small uh, in Quebec as, in, in terms of population. For the French people living there, they weren't terribly upset. The, Br the British colonists were upset that their traditional rights as Englishmen were being taken away from them by Parliament. The French Quebecois never had those traditional rights. They were living under a pretty harsh government under France and under British rule for the last 10 years. If anything, it probably given them a few more freedoms and a few more rights of self-government than they had had under the French government. So they were pretty happy. I mean, even if their government was still a little bit more oppressive and tyrannical than what the British colonists were experiencing, things seemed to be going in the right direction for the French Quebecois. So they really had very little interest in joining the protest before the war. Gotcha. Now, we takes us up then to 1775, and there is an absolute effort now to try to, I guess, conquer what is today Quebec. Can you talk about kind of that effort? It was kind of wild. Yeah. I mean, once there is an outbreak of war, there is an effort to get all the colonies involved. And I should say there were other colonies that weren't excited about the First Continental Congress. Georgia never attended the First Continental Congress, but they wanted to get all the North American colonies and including some of the island colonies. There were efforts to get Jamaica and Bermuda and the Bahamas uh, to join in a unified effort to fight with Great Britain and, and of course, Quebec. One of the ways they were going to do that was they wanted to bring in an army of liberation, so to speak, into Quebec. And of course, all the, the local French-speaking British subjects who were living there would find this liberation army of freedom to be a wonderful thing, and they would all join up, and yeah. uh, Canada would become part of the great uh, protest against Great Britain. 
I wouldn't say the the people of Quebec were particularly pro British king. Uh, sure. They were more focused on we're just sitting here trying to farm our land, and we don't really care who rules over us if they're not too much of a bastard. That that's fine. You know, if the British are going to come in and control us, it hasn't been so bad. If the Americans come in and take control, maybe they won't be so bad. So a lot of them were really kind of hedging their bets and remaining neutral. And there was a lot of propaganda on both sides. The, the sure. British were sending out lots of reasons why New Englanders were your traditional enemies. And of course, New Englanders were sending out lots of propaganda telling them why the British were their traditional enemies. Uh, and there's a lot of on both sides. I mean, you know, Massachusetts at one point had a law that called for the immediate execution of any uh, French priest found in the colony. There was a, uh, uh, they had an annual Pope's Day where they burned a um, effigy of the Pope. Yeah. Which was a very anti-Catholic thing. And of course, the French were specifically associated with Catholicism among the English at this time. So there was a lot of anti-French attitude within the uh, New England colonies. And that trying to just paper over that bad blood was not an easy thing to do. Maybe you can talk about, because they... They do take, because I think a lot of people don't even realize, they certainly don't when I was up in Quebec, the people I was talking to up there, the Americans actually occupied Montreal in that area for a while. So we talk yeah. about the kind of that that effort as well as, we have a ton of listeners from Maine, that effort that Arnold did sure. going through Maine. Uh, yeah, the, as I said, the Continental Army launched its its Army of Liberation, as I call I don't know that they actually called it that. I <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, it worked about as well as the British Armies of Liberation in the South and, well, anywhere, I guess, for that matter. Yeah. Yeah. Philip Schuyler was the in charge of the overall theater. He was a, one of the first major generals in the Continental Army. He was very working very closely with another general, Richard Montgomery, who was a former British officer who had joined the Continental Army and became one of the first brigadiers in the Continental Army. So they were they had um, started at Fort Ticonderoga, which uh, Benedict Arnold and um, Ethan Allen had captured a, a few months earlier, and they were bringing an army up through upstate New York into Canada, trying to take Montreal and eventually get up to Quebec City. As I mentioned, Arnold had originally captured Ticonderoga, but he had kind of gotten pushed out and went back to Boston, where they were uh, the Continentals were still besieging uh, the British in Boston. And he had a conversation there with George Washington. He was a colonel. Um, Arnold was a colonel at this time. Washington accepted a plan of his to go up to Maine, which was at this point part of Massachusetts, and march across the Maine wilderness to get to Quebec from the east. And he said, yeah, no, this would be no problem. <laughs> Maybe 100 miles. We can march through that, appear on the other side. We'll appear at attacking Quebec from the north. At the same time, Montgomery is attacking Quebec from the south. And the you know, dazed and confused Brits will have no choice but to surrender. Did not work out as planned. The wilderness march became a almost a disaster. The men, the boats they were using were horribly made. Um, one of the first uh, instances, I guess, of bad military contractors uh, causing problems for the army. Uh, they didn't have nearly enough food. They had launched this campaign in like November and early winter in New England wilderness is not a fun thing to do, especially when they end up having to march through a lot of wet, swampy areas. Uh, most of the army got dysentery, so marching wet, cold with diarrhea and hungry, all not a good combination. Great many of the men died just from the conditions. They ended up, they were eating their dogs, eating their shoes, um, going through a lot of misery. Big portion of the army turned back. Arnold absolutely was refusing to turn back. He just had this determination that we will make it and through force of will, it's going to happen. He ended up getting through with a portion of his army. Uh, by the time they arrived in back in civilization and reached the first French farms, they were starving, ragged, you know, wild men. And they needed a, a few weeks to basically recover themselves before they'd be in a position to do anything. In the meantime, Montgomery had marched up. They had taken parts of Canada, um, but had not yet reached Quebec. So Arnold actually reached the gates of Quebec first and demanded their surrender. Uh, they basically said, thanks, no, you look way too small and weak for us to surrender to you. <laughs> we think we can yep. hold out. Thank you. Just fine. They started besieging the city. And uh, eventually Montgomery's army came up with reinforcements and they surrounded the city, but they didn't have any cannons or anything that they could really do to take 
down the city walls. Quebec was mostly defended by British colonists. Um, the, the Americans have managed to capture most of the regulars who were in Canada by this time, uh, which was not a lot. I think it was about two regiments. So there was really nobody in Quebec to defend the city except for any locals that happened to show up. Now, fortunately for the British, a couple of former British officers, including one, I think his name was McLean. Yeah, Alan McLean showed up with a bunch of Scottish former soldiers who had settled in Canada after the French and Indian War and had been a part of actually capturing Quebec from the French years earlier. Uh, these men were the men who really defended the city of Quebec. Uh, the, the French were not terribly involved in the defense other than to the extent they were forced to. They were not involved in the attack either. Again, they were just kind of sitting this out and waiting to see what happened. The Scottish Highlanders essentially saved Quebec managed to keep the Americans out. The Americans had their army slowly disintegrating because it was cold, hungry, miserable situation. Uh, most of their enlistments were due to expire at the end of 1775. So when it got to like the last week of December, so, yeah, the last week of December, 1775, uh, a desperate general Montgomery and Colonel Arnold decided, well, if we're going to have any chance at all, we have to storm the city this week. They launched a nighttime raid led by both men, one on one side of the city, one on the other. Uh, one of the first gunshots from the defenders uh, blew off the head of General Montgomery. And so his side of the attack immediately failed. Uh, General Arnold was also shot on his side of the uh, city in, in one of the first attacks, and he had to be taken off the field. The Americans were almost immediately left without their commanders. Another colonel who eventually became a general later in the war, Daniel Morgan, Morgan, basically took command, led his men into the city, but they never got enough men in there. Uh, eventually, they just kind of occupied a few houses. The, the British defenders inside the city ended up taking them all prisoner. Attempt to capture Quebec was a failure. After that, Benedict Arnold was still in command while he was recuperating uh, from a hospital bed or a cot or whatever it was, maintained a siege of Quebec, uh, hoping that the Americans would send up more reinforcements so they could tr have another try at an actual attack before the British managed to send a relief fleet, uh, which they expected sometime in the spring or summer of 76. So they maintained that siege all winter long. Nothing much happened during that time. And then in June, a British relief fleet, I believe under General Burgoyne, uh, did show up and secure the city. Now, as I, as you said, the um, Americans had taken most of the province of Quebec other than the city. They had been defeated by another very ruthless foe, which was smallpox. Oh, uh, sure. The army was... Wiped out by the smallpox. The new command after uh, Montgomery had been killed, they sent up a new commander, Major General John Thomas. He was there for about a week before he caught smallpox and then blinded by the disease and then eventually died. They lost, I think, somewhere around 80% of the army. I think, oh, wow. killed or incapacitated, which means they had to be removed from the. It was it was a devastating illness and it really destroyed any hope of. of taking Quebec. So yeah, by the time the British arrived, the American army was a shell of its former self, and the British really had no problem pushing everyone back into New York in a matter of days. Gotcha. Now, have you ever been to Quebec City? I have not. Well, for those who have, there's a pretty, I mean, I'm sure that people have seen it, there's a pretty prominent historical marker uh, at the building that uh, Richard Montgomery's body was actually taken to after he was you know, shot during the battle, uh, right on Rue Saint Louis, down in Old Quebec. And I get this question a bunch because you know, as there's not there was a ton of Americans in my program, so like, why is this such a big deal that we have this house of the site of this you know dead body that an American was taken to? So I guess I, my question to you, for those who have have visited Quebec, why was the death of Richard Montgomery such a big deal? Who was this guy? Richard Montgomery was a former British officer who had settled in New York before the war and uh, was considered one of the best officers in the brand new Continental Army. And he was a daring, fighting leader of men who was, was very effective. You can never say anything for certain, but I would say if he hadn't had his head blown off in that first volley, he very well could have taken Quebec and Quebec could have become part of the United States as a result. It was wow. a lucky shot that stopped that. 
Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, I mean, it is. You can still see there's markers as well um, where he was hit down in um, the lower town. Uh, same thing with Arnold, where Arnold was hit. Is there's a marker there as well? It's. I mean, obviously, it's my favorite city on the planet. So, really interesting place for anybody to check out. But I will know we had a. Uh, it's funny we had a guest on the show once who called that battle plan the worst battle plan in the history of military or something <laughs> something crazy like that. They, they were not impressed. I mean, yes, you probably could have done things differently, but given their circumstances sure. and, and all that, I think it was probably the best plan they could have done. Basically, they went around behind the main walls, which are on one side of the city, try to attack the lower city first and then move in. And uh, it, it could have been a lot more effective if if they had made it you know, in force into the city um, on their first attack, um, but you know, it wasn't to be. Yeah, or if, I mean, maybe even more surprise, I guess. They would have caught him unawares. I think they would have had more success also. I do want to mention one thing, though, because um, I give a shout out to one of the listeners of this podcast. So I got to thank him again, Albert Rezibos from Winnipeg. Um, he actually did a ton of my ancestry uh, for me, which was awesome. And he pointed out that I have a direct descendant uh, who actually fought, a French Canadian who fought for Team USA in the American Revolution. So okay. h- how many... French Canadians did actually end up fighting for the Americans. And where were they? While the Americans were occupying Canada in the second half of 1775 and the first half of 1776, they raised two regiments of continental soldiers, uh, the first Canadian and the second Canadian regiments. Uh, So yes, there were some locals who joined with the continental army. Now I've never understood myself um, I've never done the enough research to know for sure how many of them were French Canadians and how many of them were British English speaking people sure. who settled in Canada in the in the decade or so that Britain had controlled the area. But there were two local regiments, probably totaling maybe about six or seven hundred men, who did join the Continental Army. Uh, one was commanded by uh, uh, Livingston. Was it John Livingston? I think the other was commanded by Moses Hazen. Who uh, Livingston was actually from New York, but Hazen was had lived in Quebec for many years before the war. He was actually a he was actually born in Massachusetts and had joined the British regular army and had fought during the French and Indian War and then settled in Quebec. So he was the commander of the of the Second Canadian Regiment. And he actually went on to become a at least by brevet a general in the Continental Army during the war. And, and the Canadian regiments did go on to fight even after uh, the British had secured Canada. Uh, they went on to fight in several campaigns. I think they fought at Brandywine, uh, several things in the Philadelphia campaign. And they may have fought in the southern uh, – uh, yeah, they were at Yorktown as well. So I am curious because obviously – France joins the war, which is a major turning point. Was there ever second thoughts now that France is officially backing Team USA? You know what? Maybe we should try to reach out to those French Canadians again to see if we can get some more of them on board. Maybe this is might be a good time to take a second set, second stab up in Quebec. Uh, there was, actually. The French joined the war by declaring war on Britain in 1778. Even before that happened, uh, several French officers had come to fight in the Continental Army, including one uh, Gilbert de Mortier, who's more famously known as the Marquis de Lafayette. There was a period, you you also have to remember 1778 was a weird time for the Continental Army. Uh, Washington had just lost Philadelphia after losing several other campaigns. Uh, At the same time, Uh, General Horatio Gates had just won a major victory at Saratoga in New York and was the hero of the hour, so to speak. A lot of people in Congress and elsewhere were talking about, well, maybe it's time for George Washington to step down and Horatio Gates to become the new commander of the Continental Army. Uh, This was uh, the the movement which happened over the winter of 77, 78 was known as the Conway Cabal because there was another French officer, uh, General Conway, who was involved in this whole thing, a continental officer who had been sure. in the French army. What Congress ended up doing was creating a board of war in which General Gates was the head of the board of war. And they put the board of war over Washington. Washington famously always had to be subservient to civilian authority. Uh, he, you know, all the colonists were always afraid that, you know, the, the war was going to create another 
um, Oliver Cromwell or sure. something like that, who would just right. become a military dictator and take over the whole thing in the chaos of war. We see many, you know, Julius Caesar did the same thing. And afterwards, of course, Napoleon did something similar. It's a very common pattern yeah, in history. Absolutely. Yep. Chaos and a strong man takes control. So that everybody was kind of nervous that George Washington might be the next Oliver Cromwell, that he might become a military dictator and try to take over everything. So he was always very scrupulous about following civilian authority. The members in Congress who didn't particularly like Washington said, well, this will work really well. We'll create a civilian authority and we'll put our hero, Horatio Gates, in charge and problem solved. Horatio Gates is running the war at this point. The problem, well, there were many problems with this. <laughs> yeah, for sure. One of them was that many of the top officers in the Continental Army were very loyal to George Washington and knew what he was doing and really respected him and did not particularly respect Gates. So it threatened to create a huge schism within the army. And one of the officers who was one of George Washington's strongest advocates was the Marquis de Lafayette, who had joined the war about a year earlier. One of the first things that this new board of war did was decide to launch an invasion of Quebec. And they were going to put the Marquis de Lafayette at the head of that army because this was going to be an army of French liberation. There you and go. We we're going to go in and get the French all excited about joining this great fight. You know, we're going to finally bring Quebec into the fold. Lafayette had a lot of problems with this, um, <laughs> one of which was that he was he was involved in this whole fight over whether Washington's going to continue to command the army or whether this board of war that was appointing him sure. to the leadership position. And he's, and he's super young during this whole thing. Yeah, he's like 20 years old at this time. Yeah, right. Crazy. Yeah. I could go on for Lafayette for, for a whole episode. And it's, <laughs> he came over here at the age of 19. He had been a captain in the French army and was even on inactive duty when they did a bunch of downsizing. So he wasn't even an active captain when he came over here. And he's like, I'd like to be a major general, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Most places would have laughed him out on his face, but he uh, he came from a very important, prominent family. Right. And they uh, decided that for purposes of Franco-American relations, it was important to, to give this guy what he wanted. And so they kind of gave him – and oh, the other big thing that really sealed the deal for him was he was insanely rich. He basically said, I will come over here. You won't have to pay me. Not only that, you won't have to pay my staff. I will pay for them. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll – pay for everything you know all you have to do is give me the title so congress is like yeah well yeah sure <laughs> Titles are and they weren't really going to let him be a general they they basically put him on george washington's staff as an essentially an aide-de-camp so he was serving alongside men like alexander hamilton or john lawrence who were colonels or lieutenant colonels and he was this major general quote unquote so right no one took it seriously that Lafayette would be a division commander, except for Lafayette. Delusions of grandeur. I shouldn't say delusions because he yeah. had to back them up in the yeah, end. Say it ended up working. Yeah. Visions of grandeur and leading a whole army. Uh, so he was fighting from the very beginning to get a real command. He proved himself very well in battle, including at the Battle of Brandywine, where he was wounded. And... Washington ended up having to dismiss one of his division commanders after Germantown for uh, drunkenness, cowardice, refusal to obey orders, all sorts of stuff, um, and ended up giving Lafayette control of this division. So Lafayette was well on his way to proving himself to be a major player in the army. And as you said, he was only 20 years old at this time. So yeah, a young guy, zero military experience before he showed up in America, and now he is one of Washington's top commanders. Yeah, I'm like a add in what I was doing at 19 or 20 years old, but wasn't, wasn't commanding an army. That's for sure. <laughs> I was holding down a minimum wage job. <laughs> there you go. But yeah, so he was doing, you know, and you got to remember too, he was, he, he came from, as I said, one of the wealthiest families in France. So he was making about a million dollars a year, just in um, passive income from his land. <laughs> when he came, when he came over, he actually bought his own ship, which carried over about 20 other officers as well as himself. Um, Filled it up with all sorts of guns and supplies and stuff. Again, bought it all at his own expense and then just gave it away when he came over here. So, yeah, money talks uh, goes along oh, for sure. talking about this stuff. So Lafayette is in this fight where they're trying to make General Gates the real head of the army. Lafayette is a huge fan of Washington. He basically considered Washington his father at this point. The men had grown very close. Another French general, Conway, was supposed to be Lafayette's second in command. 
uh, if Conway doesn't sound like a French name, it's not. He was actually right. born in Ireland, but the Irish at this time were Catholics and Britain doesn't like Catholics. And so Conway at a very young age had moved to France and joined the Irish Legion of the French army. So he had spent his entire career in the French army and he came to America where he got a commission and began fighting for the continental army. And he and George Washington did not get along. Uh, Conway had wanted to be promoted to major general. After all, they're giving these commissions out to 20 year old kids. Why can't right. I? Right. Sure. Um, Washington was reluctant to do so. So Conway did an end run around him and ended up, getting promotion from Congress. Washington was not happy about it. Conway was not happy with Washington. Uh, and they were both looking for ways to push each other out. So in the middle of all this, Conway is becoming Lafayette's second in command. Now, you know, Conway being Team Gates and Lafayette being Team Washington, they're immediately butting heads. So Lafayette gets Conway pushed out of the whole thing, brings in somebody else, uh, General de Cobb, who's another French officer, who, again, is not French. He's actually German, but <laughs> been fighting for the French army. Is there you go. So th th there's all sorts of politics going on. Right. Um, but the, the bottom line is uh, that he eventually does agree to lead the army, and the Board of War tells him, all right, go to upstate New York. There's going to be this huge army waiting there for you. It's all supplied. It's all decked out. You're going to march in and lead this army of liberation into France. The French are going to fall in behind you, and it'll be wonderful. Except it didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. Lafayette goes up to New York, finds a couple of hundred militiamen there, um, and a really pissed off general, whose name I'm not, again, not going to remember, who had originally been promised to lead this army of liberation, but was now third in command behind oh, the Cobb. No supplies, no guns, almost no men, and hope of it ever coming. Because uh, as much as Americans had lots of dreams of, of grandeur and being able to raise this huge army, they had no money. They had no supplies. They had no nothing. And Washington realized this was going to be a disaster from the beginning. And he actually warned Lafayette that it yeah. was. But he said, you know, they're ordering you to do this. Go ahead and do it. I'm, you know, I'm not going to stand in your way because I'll look like the jerk if I do. Yeah, the, he gets up there. He finds nothing. He finds that and it, and it basically proves that the Board of War is completely incompetent, that they're all talk and they don't know how to run an army and they don't know what they're doing. And that's where the Conway Cabal completely falls apart. But it also means that the mission to retake Canada fell apart before it even got started because they could never raise the supplies to do this. And a year later, they actually tried to re resurrect this idea and again put Lafayette in command of another army. And at this point, Washington was more secure in his position and he actually went to Congress and said, no, do not do this. Um, and he gave a lot of reasons, not the least of which were that we have no supplies or money or men to spare on this because, you know, the British have actually captured Philadelphia by this time and um, are threatening all sorts of other places. But he also raised another very interesting argument, which was not made public, but was something that was discussed within Congress, which was, do we really want Quebec to become French again? Because if we conquer this area with the French army's help, France is going to expect Quebec to be returned to France at the end of a victorious war. And so the question for Washington is, do we want our traditional enemy, even though they're, they're our ally at the moment, to be on our border again, or do we want Britain to be on our border again? And he s seemed to be of the idea that it was better to have Britain and that Britain probably wouldn't be able to hold Canada for that long anyway after they lost the United States. So they had a better chance of retaking all of Canada if Britain remained in control of Canada after the war. So he was very much against launching another assault on Canada at that late period of the war because they did not want Quebec to become French. I have to confess, I mean, I'm a big, obviously, a big American Revolution fan. A lot of us up here in New England are. That was the first time when I heard it on your podcast that I heard that story about Washington's take on not necessarily wanting, you know, the French on his northern border. And I thought that was incredibly fascinating. It definitely made you think about what might have happened had they actually given Lafayette an army yeah. and told them to go north and see what happened. But this has been awesome. This has been way, way fun. Obviously, taking a bunch of your time. So how far? I'm just going back to the podcast before we close. How far are you going to go? I, by the way, I vote for all the way through the constitutional ratification process, but that's just me. 
Yeah, and that's that's the real possibility. I mean, for me, the revolution, the real revolution, why it's revolutionary is not the war itself. It's the fact that we went from being a monarchy to a republic in a time when the rest of the world was dominated by monarchies. And this really was the initial move to, to making democracy a thing in, in the Western world. So yeah, I, for me, I think it would be really interesting to go through the post-war years and through the, the establishment of the Constitution and maybe a little bit even into the federal era when absolutely precedents were going on. I probably won't do that as in detailed a manner as I, I have the uh, main part of the war, which I'm taking me about 30 or 40 episodes to get through one year of war. I, I probably will... Um, just because there's not as many interesting things happening when you know, ten months out of the year everybody was just quietly living on their farms, <laughs> but the, but there are interesting things. You got you know the the Shays Rebellion, of the course. Price Rebellion, the Whiskey Rebellion, uh, the the Quasi War with France. A whole lot of interesting topics to, that come into play um, after the war and over the next couple of decades. So yeah, I mean we'll see us how far it goes, how how far people find it interesting, and certainly I certainly am not going to get in you know, to the Jacksonian era or anything like that. That, that I think is a whole different era that raises a whole different set of issues. Got you. But no, so we're going to keep going at least through the constitution, federal era. That's what I'm hearing. That yeah. sounds really, really exciting. That's awesome. Well, thank you again so much for joining us again. We were talking to Michael Troy of the American revolution podcast. Where can people find your podcast? Where can we send them? Where's the blog? The podcast is at pod.amrevpodcast.com. And the blog is at blog.amrevpodcast.com. So either of those are a good place to start. If any of you, are, you know, listen on Apple Music or Spotify or anywhere else, find podcasts are available. I'm I'm usually there. And join the Patreon. I've been a Patreon subscriber for a while now. Join the Patreon. Help support this amazing podcast. Buy some merch. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Now our fathers look at us and sigh with despair To think that everything they love we simply do not share But the spirit never dies, our culture will survive Each of us must choose how much to keep alive Each of us must choose how much to keep alive Special thanks to Josie Vashon for providing the music. You can find more about her at josievashon.com. This podcast was produced and edited by Mike Campbell. If you have any questions or comments, please email us at fclpodcast at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at fclpodcast for more information about the topics discussed. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to this episode. Malheureux.